So let's now continue with the Scholar Gypsy by Matthew Arnold. And uh, there is something that I forgot to mention in the earlier video. It is regarding the spelling of Matthew, which has a double T. So uh, please remember to write Matthew Arnold with a double T. And now we are going on to stanza 15. And uh, now he, from here onwards, uh, up to stanza 23, Matthew Arnold, uh, the poet or maybe the narrator who is telling us the whole thing, is uh, proceeding to make a comparison between the life of the scholar gypsy and the life of modern man. And he says, stanza 15, No, no, thou hast not felt the lapse of hours. For what wears out the life of mortal men? Tis that from change to change their being rolls. Tis that repeated shocks again, again, exhaust the energy of strongest souls and numb the elastic powers. Till having used our nerves with bliss and teen and tired upon a thousand schemes our wit, to the just passing genius we remit our worn out life and our what we have been. So here in this stanza, he says that you have not felt the lapse of hours. Means you remember in stanza 14, he was telling us that the whole thing was a dream and he nobody had really seen this scholar gypsy because this was a man who had lived 200 years ago and he's surely dead and buried, long buried. And so he says uh, um, that you are not real. But then in stanza 15, he says, no, no. You have not felt the lapse of hours. And then he says, uh, because why has he not felt the lapse of hours? Because he doesn't have the, the anxieties and the tensions which modern men, uh, modern men face. And so that is why he says, for, now he asks the question, what wears out the life of mortal men? And so these are the causes. One, they keep changing from change to change their being rules. There is repeated shocks again and again and even the strongest souls are worn out and they numb the elastic powers. So uh, here the reference is to the Victorian age as I told you uh, in the beginning of the earlier video that there were so many changes happening at the same time and so it was difficult for people to take in these changes. That is why he says that uh, what makes people tired? It is when you have to keep changing from one to the other and there are so many shocking things happening, new discoveries, new information, loss of old faith, and so many things. And so it numbs the elas elastic powers. Elastic uh, is flexibility. Uh, willing to broaden so even the strongest people who can adjust to everything even they find it difficult to cope up with the pressures of the age and so he says that we have uh, tired ourselves out we have tired having used our nerves up with bliss and teen and tired upon a thousand schemes so there are so many different things in which modern man is engaged and that uh, finally we just give up our life is worn out and we kind of uh, almost forget what we have been and in stanza 16 he says thou has not lived why shouldst thou perish so so if this is called living if the kind of life that we live is called living then i can surely say that you have not lived because the scholar gypsy chose to leave oxford and oxford again symbolize it is an institution and it uh, symbolizes the academic excellence it symbolizes the material world because people go to universities to learn and mainly to get a degree with which they can make a living and so he says you have not lived because you chose to walk away from uh, the portals of the university so since you have not lived you wouldn't die too okay thou has not lived why shouldst thou perish so? Thou hadst one name, one business, one desire. So you can contrast this one to the earlier thousand in the previous stanza. So the modern men, they have a thousand schemes. They start on one, 
by the time change occurs then they leave that they go on to the next one then they go on to the next one so so many changes whereas that was not the case of this man he had just one aim one business and one desire and we know what that was isn't it uh, his aim was to learn the secret of the gypsies else were thou long since numbered with the dead so if you were like us being split between all these thou i mean split among these thousand aims you would long since be counted dead else hadst thou spent like any other men thy fire the generations of thy peers are fled and we ourselves shall go but thou possessest an immortal lot and we imagine thee exempt from age and living as thou livest on glanville's page because thou hadst what we alas have not so he says that you did not spend your fire on a hundred different things or a thousand different things like us so your uh, contemporaries the generations of their peers your contemporaries people who lived with you they have all gone dead and gone and we ourselves shall go even uh, the generation that i belong to um, even this generation will pass but then you are immortal you will continue uh, to remain alive on the pages of glanville because you had what we did not have that is he had the mental peace the tranquility equanimity which these people do not have then in stanza 17 for early didst thou leave the world with powers fresh and diverted to the world without firm to their mark not spent on other things so he says why is it that this man is immortal because he left the world with powers fresh his powers had not been spent as the powers and energy of these people is being spent undiverted to the world without firm to their mark not spent on other things so he had only one aim and all his energies were diverted towards that one mark or uh, destination it was not spent on other things free from the sick fatigue the languid doubt which must much to have tried in much been baffled brings o oh life unlike to ours so you are free from sick fatigue and doubt because people who have tried many things and have been baffled have not won in any of those things won okay w o n in any of those things they would uh, give up they would be fatigued and tired but you have not experienced that who fluctuate idly without term or scope of whom each strives no knows what he strives for and each half lives a hundred different lives who wait like thee but not like thee in hope so he says modern man fluctuates idly without term or scope he doesn't know where he's headed to he doesn't know what he's aiming at he doesn't know what his destination is but all of them are striving striving and working hard and toiling struggling god knows for what he says the people who are struggling don't know what they are struggling for and each half lives a hundred different lives so then since their aims and ideas keep changing from time to time they don't live a complete life instead they live a hundred half live not even completely live but half live a hundred different lives and we to wait like you but not like you in hope the difference between this man and the other uh, and the rest of the modern population is that they are also waiting he is also waiting they are waiting for a reprieve from this uh, from the sad life whereas he is waiting with hope he is waiting to learn the secret of the gypsies so the difference is that one group has lost hope whereas this man still retains his hope now stands a 18 thou waitest for the spark from heaven and we light half believers of our casual creeds who never deeply felt nor clearly willed whose insight never has borne fruit in deeds whose vague resolves never have been fulfilled for whom each year we see breeds new beginnings disappointments new who hesitate and falter life away and lose tomorrow the ground won today ah do not we wander await it too so he says that this man is waiting hopefully for the spark from heaven uh, 
whereas we that is the rest of us the modern man we are all light believers light half believers he the scholar gypsy completely and fully believes that he will finally chance upon uh, the secret that he is looking for but modern man has no such faith they are all light half believes of a casual creeds creed is something that you believe in casual not serious so they don't have any serious faith in anything who never deeply felt nor clearly willed uh, whose insight never has borne fruit so they have had no deep feelings for anything they have no will power and they have no uh, insight uh, or uh, um, they have not worked out any of their plans and converted them into deeds and their resolves are all vague you know what resolves are resolves are strong uh, decisions like you take resolutions uh, every new year we take resolution saying that we will do this we will not do this we will start exercising from tomorrow onwards from january 1st we will start controlling our food we will start studying regularly these are all new year resolves or resolutions but then they never get fulfilled so that's why he says from whom new, new, each new year we see breeds new beginnings disappointments new so every new year brings new beginnings but then very soon we get disappointed why so because we do not have it in us we do not have the grit or the will power to carry forward uh, our dreams we leave them half way through who hesitate and falter life away and lose tomorrow the ground won today so we are always hesitant because we don't know what the right uh, and the wrong is we are always doubtful so because of this hesitance uh, we lose our we waste our life away falter means waste life away and uh, if we make some kind of a leeway today we lose it tomorrow so what we gain uh, today we lose tomorrow and then he says we too don't we wanderer we too wait for it and then in the next stanza he says yes we await it but it still delays and then we suffer and amongst us one who most has suffered talks de takes dejectedly his seat upon the intellectual throne so he says all of us to wait for some kind of a relief but then we continue to suffer and amongst us one who has most suffered so here Uh, the man who occupies the intellectual throne the one who has most suffered here the reference is to alfred lord tennyson alfred lord tennyson is one person who tried to keep uh, uh, control over things who tried to remain sane who kept saying that things will change it's all for the better even he for some time lost his faith and he sits dejectedly upon his uh, intellectual throne so you can see here that uh, matthew arnold readily accepts that um, uh, alfred lord tennyson uh, occupies the intellectual throne there doesn't seem to be any ego there and of all his store of sad experience he lays bare of wretched days tells us his miseries birth and grows and growth and signs and how the dying spark of hope was fed and how the breast was soothed and how the head all his hourly varied and all his hardly varied anodynes so he says um, that the whole stanza is about uh, alfred lord tennyson he says that uh, he had a lot of sad experiences maybe including the death of uh, arthur hallam and loss of faith and all that and he in spite of all that uh, he says that the dying spark was fed with hope and his breast was soothed and uh, his head too was cleared of all the hourly wearing anodynes and so um he talk he says that even the greatest minds of our time that is the mind of alfred lord tennyson has been adversely affected but he still tries to hold on to hope now stands at 20 this for a wisest so this is the case of the wisest Alfred Lord Tennyson is the wisest and if this is what is happening to him then what's going to happen to the rest of us this for our wisest and we others pine and wish the long and happy dream would end and wave all claim to bliss and try to bear with close-lipped patience for our only friend sad patience too near 
neighbor to despair but none has hope like thine so he says we all pine pine means suffer yearn long for something and we all wish that this unhappy dream because this life seems to be an unhappy dream we are all praying and hoping that this dream would end and uh, we uh, waive all claim to bliss that is we don't want any pleasure all that we want is to get rid of this unhappy feeling and we try to bear with close lipped patience for our only friend sad patience to na- near neighbor to this person so says that he says that we are all you know with great grit we are holding on we are waiting for this bad times to be over and our only friend is patience and the patience is too near a neighbor to despair because there is just a small gap between patience and despair a hairline kind of a uh, a gap between the two because you can continue to be patient for a long time and then one fine day the moment you lose your patience you fall into despair so that is the condition of all the modern people no no one none has hope like thine and through the fields and through the woods does stray thou through the fields and through the woods does stray roaming the countryside a truant boy nursing thy project in unclouded joy and every doubt long blown away by time so only you have hope and you are still wandering very happily clutching to your hope like a truant boy nursing thy project in unclouded joy like a truant boy a naughty boy a boy who is wandering around uh, uh, he might have some um, secret project roaming in the countryside you know the children especially in the earlier times i don't know whether your generation will even understand when i say this that um, earlier when when we were young and even before maybe at the time of matthew arnold and such things children had so many things to do uh, they could wander around with their friends or alone they could climb trees they would find maybe birds nests they would find uh, uh, some uh, kind of um, a moth or a butterfly or uh, a worm or a ladybird which they would trap and keep it with them and watch it with great pleasure so there were so many little secrets that children enjoyed and that is why you wander around the countryside like a truant boy nursing thy project in unclouded joy so the project here is his aim to get the divine spark and like a boy who has a secret uh who, which makes him very happy he doesn't share it with anybody but it takes him along and so this uh, children too generally have no doubts they are always optimistic so like a child who is so full of optimism every doubt long blown away he wanders very happily in the countryside he is a scholar gypsy and now we are on to stanza 21 oh born in days when wits were fresh and clear life ran gaily as a sparkling thames before the strange disease of modern life with its sick hurry its divided aims its heads overtaxed its palsied hearts was rife fly hence our contact fear still fly plunge deeper in the bowering wood avers as dido did dido actually it's dido did with gesture stern from her false friend's approach in hate stern wavers away and keep thy solitude so here uh, he says in stanza 21 that you were born in a beautiful age where the human wits the human mind was still fresh and clear it was not clouded by doubts and anxieties like ours and life ran gaily and happily like the sparkling thames but now we the moderns are afflicted or we have fallen for a very strange affliction and that is the disease of modern life and what are the symptoms of the sickness sick hurry we are always in a hurry divided aims that is we don't have any one aim our heads are overtaxed our hearts are weak palsied palsy is a disease where you start trembling and you lose your strength so our hearts are always trembling and this um, disease of modern life has some symptoms to what are the symptoms sick hurry divided aims overtaxed heads palsied hearts palsy in the sense trembling a palsy is a disease where uh, 
the human body becomes weak and you start uh, trembling. And so um, there is sick hurry, divided aims, heads overtaxed, its palsied hearts was rife. So here the, the sentence should be read like before the sentence, before this strange disease of modern life was rife. Rife means rampant, before this disease had spread all over. So you lived in happy times that went before this disease. So fly hens are contact fear. So he says, do not come near us because this is a contagion that would catch on to you if you come near us. Go away, stay clear of us. Still fly, plunge deeper in the bowering wood. Evers, as Dido did with gesture stern, from her false friend's approach in hate stern, wavers away and keep thy solitude. So he says that you uh, please move away from us and uh, go deeper into the forest or the woods. Evers as Dido did. Now here Dido is the queen uh, of Carthage. Now this again uh, is a story from the Greek uh, folklore and um, she fell in love with Aeneas the Trojan hero and what happened was they had uh, some very happy times together and then he left her because he was prompted by the gods to leave her and he abandoned her on the uh, island um, or, or in Carthage and he sailed away in a ship uh, and what Dido did was she set up a pyre and she um, jumped into uh, the flames and killed herself and later on it is said that uh, when um, Aeneas met uh, Dido after in the afterworld after death so when uh, he met her and went towards her she turned away from him and walked away okay so that is the comparison so he tells uh, the scholar gypsy uh, to <coughs> behave like Dido ever as Dido did with gesture stern from her false friend's approach who is the false friend Aeneas because he had cheated her so she just turned away and showed her aversion towards him when he approached her in hates so similarly Turn away from us, wave us away, keep thy solitude, do not mingle with us. If you intend to remain happy, please go away from us. So this is an example of an extended simile where uh, a totally different a story from a totally different context is brought in to make this idea clear. So this is an example of an extended simile. And uh, now in stanza 22, uh, still nursing the unconquerable hope, still clutching the inviolable shade with a free onward impulse brushing through by night the silver branches of the glade, far on the forest skirts where none pursue, on some mild pastoral slope emerge and resting on the moonlit pales, freshen thy flowers as in former years with dew or listen with enchanted ears from the dark tingles to the nightingales. So he says, go away from us, walk away, still nursing the unconquerable hope. You still have the unconquerable hope within you. Keep it there, keep it safe. And you move away from us through the night, through the silver branches. Silvered branches are the branches on which you have the moonlight falling and go away to the far forest skirts where nobody would come after you and there in some mild pastoral slope which is far away from modern men they emerge and rest there uh, and continue as in former years to freshen your flowers with dew or listen with enchanted ears from the dark tingles to the nightingales so listen to the nightingales have a nice time relax, uh, enjoy nature and have a nice time. Okay, go away from us. Now stands at 23, but fly our paths, our feverish contact fly, for strong the infection of a mental strife, which though it gives no bliss, yet spoils for rest. And we should win thee from thy own fair life, like us distracted, like us unblessed. So he says, fly our paths, please don't come 
into contact with us because our contact is feverish because we are all suffering from a fever the fever of modern life the fever of changes the fever of industrialization the fever of uh, uh, lack of religious faith all this is happening a fever of materialism so go away from all this for strong the infection of a mental strife because our mental strife is so strong so infectious that Though it cannot give any happiness, it can spoil happiness. So don't come near us. And I am afraid that if you come too close to us, we will take you away from your fair life. Should we win thee from thy own fair life? Means he is worried that if the scholar gypsy comes close to the human, the moderns, he will lose his happiness too. And soon what would happen to you if you become like us? You will become distracted like us. You will become unblessed like us. And all your cheer, your happiness will die. Your hopes will grow timorous. Now he has uh, uh, an inviolable hope. All that hope will grow timorous means trembling. He will lose faith in himself. And your powers will be unfixed. The concentration that you have. Now, so far, you have not been distracted. You have just one aim. But if you mingle with us, your powers will be unfixed. They will become inconsistent. They will lose their aim. Their clear aims be cross and shifting made. So now you have clear aims. But if you join us, you will lose the clarity of your ideas. And it will be made shifting, means changing. And then, the glad perennial youth would fade fade and grow old at last and die like ours and then what would happen as the net result of this your youth you have been young for the past 200 years you will continue to be so if you don't come in contact with us perennial something that uh, lasts for a long time you know goes throughout the year you have perennial plants that don't dry up that keep flowering and bearing fruit throughout so he says your youth which is now eternal will soon fade and grow old like us and you will die your youth will just die out so do not come near us okay so he was making a contrast between the life of the scholar gypsy and the life of the moderns and he gives him a warning not to come too close now the last two stanzas stanza 24 then fly our greetings, fly our speech and smiles, as some grave Tyrian trader from the sea, descried at sunrise an emerging prow, lifting the cool head creeper stealthily, the fringes of a southward facing brow among the Aegean Isles, and saw the merry Grecian coaster come, freighted with amber grapes and the sh and Sheehan wine, green bursting figs and tunny steeped in brine and knew the intruders on his ancient home the young light-hearted masters of the waves snatched his rudder and shook out more sail and day and night held on indignantly over the blue midland waters with the gale betwixt the Certus and soft sicily to where the atlantic raves outside the western straits and unbent sails there where down cloudy cloudy cliffs through sheets of foam, shy traffickers, the dark Iberians came, and on the beach undid his corded bales. So the last two stanzas, I read them together, because <clears throat> you can see that the, the, uh, the last line in stanza 24 doesn't end there with a full stop. There is a comma at the end. It just continues on to the next stanza. Now this again is a, is a poetic technique which is called enjambment. Enjambment where one line doesn't end the last line of the stanza doesn't mark an end but is carried on the idea is ca carried on to the next stanza so he says so the concluding message to the um, scholar gypsy is this go away from us fly our greetings means if we greet you don't bother to greet us back just leave from here uh, fly our speech and smiles don't be attracted by our speech or smiles just fly away from us and again he gives <coughs> another epic uh, simile this uh, is an example of an epic simile here the scholar gypsy is compared to a tyrian trader a trader from the place called tyre t-y-r-e and mm, uh, so you can see that there is a ship 
coming and it is the ship of a Tyrian trader and as he uh, travels forward far away he sees another ship and when he uh, takes a close look at it he finds out that that ship belongs to the Greeks and the Greeks were known to be troublemakers and so as soon as the Tyrian trader saw the Greek coaster coaster is a ship a huge ship that bears a lot of cargo and so as soon as uh, this um, Tyrian trader saw the Greek ship the coaster coming towards him immediately he turned his uh, he changed his route he turned his uh, ship and uh, redirected it towards another path and uh, here there is also uh, a mention of the coaster the Grecian coaster and what are the uh, what are the the goods that this coaster carries it is freighted or it is loaded with amber grapes you have uh, ripe grains there is wine she and wine and uh, there is bursting green bursting figs ripe figs there are tunny steeped in brain tunnies uh, fish tuna okay tuna fish which is uh, um, what are uh, put in uh, brine or salt water uh, and so uh, all these there is something special about all these uh, goods they are all short-lived perishable goods okay and uh, so as soon as this Tyrian trader saw the Greeks he knew that these were the people who once uh, conquered his earlier his ancient home and he knew that they were dangerous people and immediately he went off the young light-hearted masters of the waves um, uh, and so what he did was as soon as he saw them he snatched his rudder and he shook out more sail and he went another way and he went day and night he held on indignantly over the blue midland waters and finally he went uh, towards sicily and he crossed over and he reached the atlantic ocean and there he finally came to iberia iberia is spain and he stopped only after he reached spain far away from the greeks and there he unloaded his bales uh, in the beach he un, uh, undid his corded bales bales is uh, is the goods that he brought the cargo and he laid out his uh, wares open for the shy traffickers the dark iberians um, so uh, the dark iberians came and they i mean he laid out all his uh, uh, the items that they had brought for uh, to these people so here what is the comparison that we should understand i told you this is an epic simile so here just like the greek uh, just like the tyrians run away from the greek ships same way he tells the scholar gypsy that you too should run away from us do not come anywhere near us okay so that is the uh, the last answer and we have come to the end of the poem and you can now see why this poem is called uh, the masterpiece of uh, uh, Matthew Arnold because it's so beautifully structured and again it voices all the anxieties of uh, Matthew Arnold and not only of Matthew Arnold of the entire era the Victorian era all the confusions and unhappiness they felt has been expressed here now let us quickly discuss the themes in this poem um, one thing it expresses the inner conflict of Arnold and as I told you it was not just the conflict that Arnold experienced but it was a conflict that many of his contemporaries went through and uh, the loss of faith and uh, the struggle between spiritualism and materialism so that is one important theme and he talks about this disease that um, has afflicted this uh, the modern man and when he talks about the disease this is exactly what he is talking about even in another poem you have um, this uh, poem called uh, Dover Beach there too he voices the same concern he is worried that um, uh, the protective cover the protective kind of um, uh, coating of religious faith 
is slowly being removed and we are exposed to all sorts of dangers because God uh, we we do not believe that God is there to uh, safeguard us anymore so that same worries you can see uh, are presented here then another thing he talks about is the restlessness of modern life uh, i guess it started right from the modern uh, from the victorian times and we today are still experiencing it we are all in a hurry um, in a frenzy we are rushing towards god knows where and at the end of all this when we look back we find that there is nothing worth remembering in life so the restlessness and the meaninglessness of modern life that too uh, can be seen here uh, and then how he talks about the evils of modernity mm, the lack of faith uh, too much of industrialism pollution um, yeah, and materialism Uh, looking at everything only from the scientific point of view uh, depending only on or believing only in empiric uh, truth not believing in god so all that are the evils of modernity uh, and it it uh, harasses people and it oppresses people it makes them so much less productive than what they are capable of so that again the evils of modernity uh, is mentioned and then again there is also um, another theme of the dangers of conformity uh, where oxford is a symbol of conformity it is an institution which trains people to live uh, an accepted way of life and the scholar gypsy is individuality so you have conformity versus individuality uh, the scholar gypsy had it in him he had the courage to break away from Uh, the regulations he had the courage to um to walk out of conformity and uh, establish his individuality whether he succeeded in learning the secret or not is not what matters <coughs> what matters is that he had the courage to uh, forge his own path he had the courage to choose the untrodden path so you can see that again is appreciated so th- looking at it that way this poem is a celebration of individuality the scholar gypsy is is honored for having shown um, the will power and the determination to uh, strike out on his own and to find his own uh, path and uh, to have a kind of uh, an aim that is undistorted by the people around him by the customs and traditions around him and then again you can see there is um, uh, you can see this rural versus urban because rural seems to represent everything that is quiet and calm and serene and happy whereas urban symbolizes unhappiness unrest meaninglessness um, frenzy palsy all that is uh, represented by the urban so you can see that divide between rural and urban so these are the uh themes um of course on which you can elaborate you can do more reading and elaborate on it and so with this i think um i will put an end to the discussion on the scholar gypsy